so tonight we're going to take a uh, take a closer look at um, the Noble Eightfold Path, and uh, to do so, um, we'll get a little kind of perspective from where the Noble Eightfold Path originates from, and that is, of course, the Four Noble Truths. The Noble Eightfold Path is the fourth element in the Four Noble Truths. It's the fourth truth. And so, <clears throat> kind of to render a perspective about the, about the Four Noble Truths, I thought it would be useful to, um, to talk about that just for a few minutes. And so, I was checking out the, um, the editor of uh, the Majjhima Nikaya, this book, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who writes a little, he, he, he writes an intro to the Four Noble Truths. And I thought I couldn't say it any better than he did. So I'll just read a little bit of that and we'll get oriented to the, to the fourth truth, the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, and then we'll dive into that. And what we'll do is try to apply it to the meditation that we're doing here, to your practice, so that this is, has a lot of practicality to it. So it's just not theory. And also that what we're doing here is learning two different ways. We're learning by understanding. In other words, these are sort of maps that we're making. And these maps aren't the territory, but when you go into your practice and you go into the meditation, you're going into the territory. You don't have the map anymore. You're investigating and you're exploring and you're developing internally to have the experience of what we're talking about here. So I, I hope this is practical and useful. <clears throat> the Buddha's teaching is called Dharma, a word that can signify both truth transmitted by teaching and conceptual verbal medium by which the truth is expressed in order that it can be communicated and comprehensible. The Dhamma, sometimes called Dharma, and that's the Sanskrit, is not a body of immutable dogmas or a system of speculative thought. It is essentially a means a raft for a crossing over from the near shore of ignorance, craving, and suffering to the far shore of transcendental peace and freedom. Because his aim is setting forth his teaching is a pragmatic one, deliverance from suffering, the Buddha can dismiss the whole gamut of metaphysical speculation as a futile endeavor. Those committed to it, he compares to a man struck by a poisoned arrow who refuses the surgeon's help until he knows the details about the assailant and his weaponry. Being struck by an arrow of craving, afflicted by aging and death. Humanity is in urgent need of help. The remedy the Buddha brings as a surgeon for the world is the Dhamma. This he discloses both the truth of our existential plight and the means by which we can heal our wounds. The Dhamma that the Buddha discovered and taught consists of its core in four noble truths the truth of suffering. The noble truth of the origin of suffering. The noble truth of the cessation of suffering. And the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. The pivotal notion around which the truths revolve is that of dukkha, translated here as suffering. The Pali word originally meant simply 
pain and suffering, a meaning it retains in text when it's used as a quality of feeling. In these cases, it has been rendered as pain or painful. As the first noble truth, however, dukkha is far wider significance, reflective of a comprehensive philosophical vision. While it draws its effective coloring from its connection with pain and suffering, and certainly includes these, the points beyond such restrictive meaning to the inherent unsatisfactoriness of everything conditioned. This unsatisfactoriness of the conditioned is due to its impermanence, its vulnerability to pain, and its inability to provide complete and lasting satisfaction. The notion of impermanence, anicca, forms the bedrock for the Buddhist teaching. Having been the initial insight that impelled the Bodhisattva to leave the palace in search of a path to enlightenment, impermanence, in the Buddhist view, comprises the totality of conditioned existence, ranging in scale from the cosmic to the microscopic. At the far end of the spectrum, the Buddha's vision reveals a universe of immense dimensions, evolving and disintegrating in repetitive cycles throughout beginningless time, many eons of world contractions, many eons of world expansion. The second of the Four Noble Truths makes known the origin or cause of suffering. The Buddha identifies as craving, tanha, in its three aspects, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for being, that is for continuous existence, and craving for non-being, that is personal annihilation. The third truth states the converse of the second truth, that with the elimination of craving and suffering that originates from it will cease without remainder. So that's the cessation of suffering, of dukkha. Nibbana or Nirvana in Sanskrit. The state of Nibbana that superverses when ignorance and craving have been uprooted is called Nibbana. And no conception in the Buddhist teachings has proven more refractory to conceptual pinning down than this one. In a way, such elusiveness is only to be expected since Nibbana is described precisely as profound, hard to see, hard to understand, unattainable by mere reasoning. So that kind of lays the groundwork where where we're going with the fourth noble truth, with the um, noble eightfold path. This is Majjhima Nikaya 117, the Maha Chacharika Sutta, the great 40. Thus I have heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anapadika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, 
bhikkhus, I shall teach you noble right concentration with its supports and requisites. Listen and attend closely to what I say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. The blessed one then said this. What bhikkhus is noble right concentration with its supports and requisites? That is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness. Unification of mind equipped with these seven factors is called noble right concentration with its supports and requisites. So in this case, we're using uh, the word collectedness in our practice here rather than concentration. Concentration typically denotes a single pointed focus and a, um, a, an absorption or a, uh, a, a, a one pointed connection with whatever kind of object there is. In this case, we use collectedness because it is a, uh, a type of attentiveness that's directed toward and, um, and, uh, and collects around a kind of a, the comp it composes rather than um, uh, focuses upon. He also brings up unification of mind equipped with these seven factors is called noble right concentration. In the case of noble, he uses this term because in the case of noble, in the days that he lived, nobility was always expected to be above and beyond the common, uh, the common parlance, the common man. They were always expected to, uh, to provide for the subjects that they, um, that they were um, the head of, and they were expected to be both generous, protective, like a parent. And so this sort of sense of nobility is carried into the, the, uh, the meaning of the Noble Eightfold Path, something that is um, that is supersedes the common. So we continue. There on bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view as wrong view and right view as right view. This is one's right view. So we're comparing now, we're gonna see a comparison between what is considered right and what is considered wrong, why it's right and why it's wrong. And I'd like you to note how this applies in your practice. And what bhikkhus is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no fruit or result of good and bad. No this world, no other world, no mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously, no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other worlds. This is wrong view. Let's break that down a little bit. So he says wrong view is that where nothing is offered. This is the lack of generosity. And that there is no, no other world. In other words, these, this is the, the, a philosophy or a view of just materiality. There's nothing beyond materiality. He goes on to say, no fruit or result of 
good and bad actions. So this is the understanding of karma. This is the understanding of causes and effects. The understanding of causes and conditions. He goes on to say, no mother and no father. This is the lack of acknowledging the importance of parents that coming into this world and being born into the opportunities to seek um, a spiritual life, to seek betterment, to be able to, um, to be beneficial to other beings, other people, um, is not acknowledged in wrong view. He goes on to say, no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare that this world and the others, this is wrong view. So these are teachers that there are Buddhas, there are Arahats, there are um, awakened people to be able to help people um, deal with their problems, deal with their suffering, to overcome um, pain and suffering. And that the wrong view is to not acknowledge that these people exist. And what bhikkhus is right view? Right view, I say, is twofold. There is right view that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in acquisitions. There is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. So let's break that down a little bit. Factor of the path. So these are the results of the good results that come from practice, from meditation, and from virtuous behavior. He says, um, he says, I say it is twofold. There are right views that are affected by the taints. And so this means that although we have what are called the taints. And that is craving, craving for sensual pleasures, uh, craving for existence, craving for annihilation. These are called the taints. And that although we have them, we can still hold a wholesome and harmonious view, the right view. And what bhikkhus is right view that is affected by the taints partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. There is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are in the world good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is right view affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. So, Fundamentally, that is saying that there is the understanding that there is value in honoring parents and that there is a, can be an acknowledgement of um, rebirth spontaneously in other realms. So even in the Christian uh, religion. They talk about reborn in heaven. So that's a view that there is not just this world, not just this material plane. And so he's acknowledging the same thing, that right view 
even though we have the taints and that we partake in merit, we make meritorious actions by helping others, that this view is supported. So these are the supporting factors and the uh, requisites for right view. And what bhikkhus is the right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. The wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states, the power of wisdom, the path factor of right view in those whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the path. This is right view. This is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the path. So this is describing an arahat. This is describing someone that has a pure mind, that does not have any taints anymore. So you have a couple of other factors that we have added onto this. And this is the wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, and the power of wisdom. So that denotes, in this case, anytime we hear wisdom, when the Buddha is talking about it, we're talking about the understanding of dependent origination cause and effect, causes and conditions. And that we discussed last night. So then the question is how? How do we come about this? One makes an effort to abandon wrong view, to enter upon right view. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong view. Mindfully one enters upon and abides in right view. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right view. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. So we're doing this every day. Every time we do the six R's. We are realigning from a wrong view, from, the, um, from an unwholesome state. I don't like it. I don't want it. I need this. I am that. I have to get this. It is that selfing process. And every time we do that and we use the six R's, we use right effort we release that and we come into right view. Mindfully abandon. And again, thus these three states run circle around right view. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. The second fold in the Noble Eightfold Path, right intentions. They're in bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong intentions as wrong intentions and right intention as right intentions. This is one's right view. So you see, in order to gain a right intention, we have to have a right view, a right view, a view that is harmonious with the Dhamma, harmonious with the nature. And so the right view here is sets up the ability to formulate a right intention, a harmonious intention, and a balanced intention. And what bhikkhus is wrong intention? The intention of sensual desires, 
the intention of ill will, the intention of cruelty. This is wrong intention. So let's just recall that here the Buddha is talking to a group of bhikkhus. And so he's not talking about lay people. So when he's talking about sensual desire, he means that this is particularly to those who are recluses, brahmins, and monks. The intention of ill will and the intention of cruelty. Ill will is hatred. It is aversion rooted in aversion, the intention of cruelty. Cruelty is to want to hold or continue to inflict pain and suffering on some being. And this, he admonishes, is, of course, wrong view. And what bhikkhus is right intention? Right intention, I say, is twofold. There is right intention that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, and there is right intention that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the path. So here he is clearly saying that by doing meritorious acts, even though there is still craving that we experience, we still can hold right intention. And that that intention is noble. It is taintless and is super mundane and a factor of the path. What's that? The path of awakening. And what bhikkhus is right intention that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in acquisitions, the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of non-cruelty. This is right intention that is affected by taints, ripening in the acquisitions. And what bhikkhus is right intention that is noble taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. And here again, he's talking to the arahats. The thinking, thought, intention, mental absorption, mental fixity, directing the mind, verbal formation in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path, and is developing the noble path. This is the right intention that is noble and a factor of the path. So that's pretty clear. So now how? How is that intention developed? And here he simply says, one makes an effort. It's about making the effort. One makes an effort to abandon wrong intention to enter upon right intention. This is one's right effort. Again, going back to right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong intention. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right intention. This is one's right intention. Thus, these three states run and circle around right intention. That is right view right effort, and right mindfulness. So every day in this practice, we're practicing mindfulness. And with that, we develop right view. And with the six R's, right effort, and they circle around one another. So the practice incorporates exactly what the Buddha states here. That is right intention, uh, the second fold in the eightfold path. Speech. Therein bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong speech is wrong speech. And right speech is right speech. 
this is one's right view. Again, we come back to having the right view. And what bhikkhus is wrong speech, false speech, malicious speech, harsh speech, and gossip. This is wrong speech. So false speech, that's deceiving somebody, lying. Malicious speech, that speech is, is meant to harm someone. Her speech, four letter words, that's an example of her speech. Um, uh, things that are hard, hard on the ears, not sweet on the ears. Gossip, gossip is when we talk about somebody when they're not present. And the, then the question is, you know, would we talk about them in the same way if they were present in the room? So um, here mindfulness comes in again. Is this, is this the right, is this the right speech? And what bhikkhus is right speech that is affected by taints partaking of merit ripening in the acquisitions, absent of false speech, absent of malicious speech, absent of harsh speech, absence of gossip. This is right speech that is affected by the taints ripening in the acquisitions. And what bhikkhus is right speech that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. This desisting from the four kinds of verbal misconduct. The abstaining, refraining, and absence from them in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right speech that is noble a factor of the path. So that would be how an orhat would conduct themselves, a pure being. So how do we do this again? And he points out, one makes an effort to abandon wrong speech and to enter upon right speech. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong speech. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right speech. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right speech. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. So we come right back to our practice of developing right mindfulness, having the right view, and applying the right effort, the six R's. The next fold is right action. Therein, bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong action as wrong action, right action as right action. This is one's right view. And what bhikkhus is wrong action? Killing living beings, taking what is not given, the misconduct in sensual pleasures. This is wrong action. So every morning we take these precepts and these precepts uh, are in a sense, a protection, a reminder to, um, to observe a, a, a boundaries that are wholesome, are um, noble. Um, I think they speak pretty much for themselves. And what bhikkhus is right action? Right action, I say, is twofold. There is right action that is affected by taints, 
partaking in merit, ripening in the acquisitions, and there is right action that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the path. So again, we're going to look at what is um, the non-enlightened and the uh, awakened as an as a, as a, an an arahat would uh, would partake in right action. And what, bhikkhus, is right action that is affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions? Absence from killing living beings, absence from taking what is not given, absence from misconduct in sensual pleasures. This is the action that is affected by taints ripening in the acquisition. And what, bhikkhus, is the right action that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path? The desisting from the three kinds of bodily misconduct, abstaining, refraining, abstinence from them in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, whose possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right action. This is a factor of the path. So again, how do we do that? So here the Buddha prescribes, one makes an effort to abandon wrong action and to enter upon right action. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong action. Mindfully, one enters upon and dwells in right action. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run in circle around right action. That is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Again, using the six R's, having the right view, having mindfulness. Therein, bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong livelihood as wrong livelihood, right livelihood as right livelihood. This is one's right view. And what bhikkhus is wrong livelihood? Scheming, talking, hinting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain, this is wrong livelihood. So this is, again, he's talking to monks. And I think the other night we talked about schisms in the Buddhist order. So here he mentions scheming, and that is to uh, upset the, um, uh, the community of monks. Uh, but scheming also in, um, in everyday life can uh, create issues. So belittling, pursuing gain with gain, that's kind of trading favorites. I'll do this if you do that. Um, and dealing in certain ways that may or may not be wholesome. And what bhikkhus is right livelihood? Right livelihood, I say, is twofold. There is right livelihood that is affected by taints pertaining to merit, ripening in the acquisitions, and there is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, and super mundane, a factor of the path. So, <clears throat> and what bhikkhus is right livelihood that is affected by taints partaking in merit? ripening in acquisitions. Here, bhikkhus, a noble disciple abandons wrong livelihood and gains his living by right livelihood. That is a livelihood that is affected by the taints, ripening in the acquisitions. 
and what bhikkhus is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. The desisting from wrong livelihood, the abstaining, refraining, abstention from it is one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses noble path and the developing of the noble path. This is right livelihood that is noble, a factor of the path. So this is how a, a pure being would behave. So again, he, he suggests how to do this, and this is his suggestion. One makes an effort to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter upon right livelihood. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong livelihood. Mindfully, one enters upon and dwells in right livelihood. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right livelihood. That is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Sound familiar? So we've gone through the, the eight folds of the eightfold path. The great 40. They're in bhikkhus. Right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, right intention comes into being. In one of right intention, right speech comes into being. In one of right speech, right action comes into being. In one of right action, right being comes into being. In one of right action, right livelihood comes into being. In one of right livelihood, right effort comes into being. In one of right effort, right mindfulness comes into being. In one of right mindfulness, right concentration comes into being. In one of right knowledge, right deliverance comes into being. Thus, eight factors, thus bhikkhus. The path of the disciple is, in higher training, possesses eight factors. The orahat possesses ten. So those last two factors of right knowledge and right deliverance, that's for the arahat. The first eight are for everybody. There in bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, wrong view is abolished. And the many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong view as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right view as condition come into fruition by development. In one of right intention, wrong intention is abolished. And the many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong intention as conditioned are also abolished. And the many unwholesome states that originate with right intention as conditions come into fulfillment by development. In one of right speech, wrong speech is abolished. In one of right action, wrong action is abolished. In one of right livelihood, wrong livelihood is abolished. In one of right effort, wrong effort is abolished. In one of right mindfulness, Wrong mindfulness is abolished. In one of right concentration, wrong concentration is abolished. In one of right knowledge, wrong knowledge is abolished. In one of right deliverance, wrong deliverance is abolished. In the many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong deliverance as conditioned are also abolished. In the many unwholesome states that originate with right deliverance as conditioned,
come to fulfillment by development. The sutta goes on for another several paragraphs, um, uh, but that is the conclusion uh, I think that we need to investigate tonight as in terms of uh, the uh, the uh, noble eightfold path and um, there is no oh. share merit may suffering ones be suffering free and the free struck fearless be may the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief May all beings share in this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.